Continue with the second part of the who will share their work with us today uh, in this uh, second part of our first panel in this conference. Dr. Maria Gomez Martin is an assistant professor of Spanish and Translation Studies at California State University at San Marcos, where she teaches courses at the graduate and undergraduate level on Spanish translation, contemporary Spanish literature and culture, and history of the Spanish language. She has developed a certificate in translation studies and her research interests extend to transnational narratives, exile, and travel literature, as well as Hispanic applied linguistics, Spanish heritage acquisition, and contemporary translation studies. Today she will be presenting her paper entitled Manuel Duran y Roberto Díaz, Exiles Writers in the USA. Um, so first of all, thank you for your introduction. Um, I would like to thank Professor Mariana Calderon for inviting me to be here today, and also the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of Maryland for hosting such an important event. <clears throat> It's, uh, it's always good to be back, back home, actually. And thank you to my previous colleagues for, for recognizing the important role of women of, uh, uh, involved in the worst tragedy of the Spanish 20th century, our civil war. Today, in the 80th anniversary of the tragedy of the Spanish Republic and exile of 1939, we are gathered to revisit the contributions of some of many Spaniards in the Americas and the United States and to try to fill some of the, get, the gaps, silences, and emptiness left in the collective memory of this divided country. In this occasion, I'm going to focus on the American journey of Roberto Ruiz and Manuel Duran, two authors that constantly reflect about their memories, alienation, and identity crisis as children of the Spanish Civil War. Their search for answers will become a constant in their life, to the point that the acceptance of the exiliating circumstance as a condition of their own being. But let's start from the beginning. Over the course of the 20th century, the concept of war has evolved and shaped every aspect of the lives, not only of those who suffer, but also the generations after. However, there's a big difference between parents and children. The former were always aware of um, their ideals and their struggle. The latter inherited their parents' fate without questioning it. In that regard, Peter Towson, in his book El Grito de los Niños, or the Children's Cry, says, and I quote, of all the calamities that could unexpectedly afflict a child, nothing is worse than suffering without knowing why. A man knows why he goes to war and what his role is. A child doesn't. And that is true. Children are, and they've always been, the largest unknown group in our conference. <coughs> the surviving children of any war will drag the rest of their lives to the physical and psychological consequences of such terrible experiences, such as hunger, fear, family separations, imprisonment, humiliation, destruction, exile, or even death. Surviving an armed conflict, regardless of the country or the historical moments, is essential for the reconstruction of a historiographical discourse that includes not only the version of those who won, but also the defeated. In our case, the Spanish Civil War caused the mass escape of thousands of Republicans and the largest exodus of children in Europe and then. In Spain, it wasn't until the 80s that we could find the first sociological and historical works focused on the experience of these children. But as Maurice Hallworks remembers us, there is a period of witnesses who can transmit the collective memory of each historians with traces of a problematic past impossible to recover. 
For that reason, it is extremely important to rescue and study the work of this generation of children that are the largest, the last generation of witnesses is still alive. But, so I'm going to introduce them. In this context, we understand as members of the second generation, those children of Spanish refugees born in Spain between 1924 and 1939, who were forced to go into exile with their families when they were still children or adolescents. Since the publication in 1980 in the Peñalabra magazine of the first poetic anthology dedicated to this group, the term second generation or segunda generación has been the most used. However, the terminology to describe them is extensive, and even today they are better known as Hispano-Mexicanos or Nepantla Generation, and now a word first used by Francisco de la Maza that means the land in between. They are Spanish and they're Mexican, but they're neither Spanish nor Mexican. They do not know very well what the role in exile is, but they feel, they feel that it's important. Their exile is an heritage, accepted in most cases, but in any case, it is not the product of their history, but their parents. For these children, Me Mexico became their new home, a place that suggested future and hope. Unlike for their parents, the image of Spain for the children of the second generation was vague and weaker due to distance, the passage of time, and their lack of rational uh, memory. Paradoxically, <coughs> these children were educated in Mexico and attended a school specifically designed for them to keep alive the Republican values of their parents and educators. These strong family, educational, and cultural bonds they grew up with made more difficult for them their adaptation and assimilation to the Mexican society. They were almost forced to be and feel spent. <coughs> and they grew up with the idea that in order to mature both personally and professionally, they had to define their own specific nationality. Jose de la Colina, is one of the famous storytellers in the group, reproduced in his blog, El Correo Fantasma, the following conversation he had with one of his classmates one of his cuates, when he was still in school. Um, so they asked each other, So de España, de México, de donde eres? Soy del exilio como de un país. ¿Cómo? No entiendo. Mejor dicho, fui del exilio como de un país. Entonces, ¿qué? ¿Tú eres mexicano, español o qué? Ni soy de aquí, ni soy de allá, como dice la canción. Soy del país del exilio. This way of understanding the status of exile as a country, or even a nationality, allows the creation of a new space of representation that specifically arises in the marginal, peripheral, and subaltern position where these children are, that is somewhere in the middle between Spain and Mexico, lost in the waters of the Atlantic Ocean, um, <clears throat> and uh, it's a new space in conjunction with the third space concept of Homi Baba, characterized by its difference, hybridity, and otherness. We can see that as these children grew up, and they went to the university, mainly the UNAM, in Mexico in the 50s. They were influenced by French existentialists. Then the, the exile acquires a new existential transfiguration, as well as a profound and complex introspection aimed to, uh, at understanding, as understanding exile not as a topic or a leitmotiv in the works, but as a condition of their own being. This is going to be particularly relevant for Manuel Duran and Roberto Ruiz. Two authors who came to the U.S. reluctant to be confined to one place or one culture. They were both born in the same year, 1925, and they're still alive, both of them. For them, the issue of identity transcends the Spain-Mexico binomial by taking the experience of exile to another level, opening to the dimension of interpretation of human life. Manuel Duran was born in Barcelona on March 28, 1925. Son of an important Republican lawyer, he fled with his family from fascist Spain in 1939. They lived in France, but could manage to leave in 1942 to Mexico. In Mexico, Duran earned his undergraduate degrees in law, literature, and philosophy from the University of Mexico, and also became a simultaneous interpreter for the United Nations, what brought him to the United States, where he also received his PhD in Spanish literature at Princeton University in 1953. But his first, job, his first job as an academic at Smith College, and then a few years later, he joined the Yale faculty in 1960, where he remained until his retirement after being granted emeritus status at that institution. He's an authority of the Spanish Golden Age, especially Cervantes and Quevedo. His prolific work includes more than 40 books and 200 articles on Hispanic writers, poets, paying special attention to Catalan artists, both in exile and in the mainland. 
It is also worth mentioning that in 1981, he was named Knight of the Order of Isabel la, the Catholic, or Isabel la Católica, with the rank of commander for his work in favor of the dissemination of the Spanish culture in the US. He proudly displayed his medal both at his office and later at his home, and also recognized, and I quote him, it has never occurred to me to ask people to address me as Comandia Dura, because that would be too pretentious. Way too pretentious, he says. And besides, in politics, I have never been a royalist, as you can imagine. Manuel Duran has affirmed that even those who, best, who were best adapted to exile, nostalgia can rebound at any time. And he thinks that it's like a malaria. You can never be sure if you are completely pure or not, but it doesn't really matter. On the contrary, he says, many of us has, have institution, institutionalized sorry, our nostalgia. Since we couldn't live in Spain nor forget about it, we have chosen to turn this situation into a profession. This was the case of most of them, who chose the path of writing and teaching uh, as a profession and use literature as a vehicle for expressing their, their experiences, their thoughts, and their memories of Spain and exile. A solid bone capable of resisting the loneliness caused <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, um, the passage of time, because the power of memory lies in the possibility and the strength of recreation and making presence of the absence on the past, present, and even the future. It is worth mentioning that Duran's work, there is no explicit reference to exile, nor the name of Spain is ever cited, ever. This can surprise us because in an interview in 1974, talking about himself and his peers of the second generation, he says that the exile, and I quote, had been the ingredient of everything we said, thought, and wrote, an undeniable signature of our, of our activity, end of quote. These words then pose a challenge to, our, to his readers, like me, since we feel the obligation of finding that ingredient in, uh, that he, the author has especially hidden in his verses. For instance, in the poem Exaltación a un poeta perezoso, the issue of the personal identity is questioned using the symbol of the song. Um, and, and according to Duran, if you don't sing, you don't exist. So uh, I translated the poem, so I don't have the Spanish here, so let's see the, the English says. An old proverb says, if you don't sing, you don't exist. You don't know who you are, you don't know your face. Your song defines you, your voice is a mirror, it finally gives you your name. Your voice is your refuge, only passport to the land of men. Without your voice, without your singing, the dawn does not catch fire, water does not cleanse you, wine does not exalt you. Without your singing, you don't exist, nor do those who heard your voice. The poem ends, ends with a familiar <coughs> reference to the other, since only the inspiration <coughs> can come to exist. Without your singing, you do not exist, nor your voice. Duran's poetic discourse, decentralized and unfolded, managed to uncover and encompass in the other of his verse a we, who seems to be inscribed in the existence of the exiled community to which he belongs. Hence, the anguish for not being able to define his identity becomes a constant theme in his work, even expressing it in one of his last short poems, just three verses here, in which Duran is able to convey the search for the past present self in the figure of the other due to the impossibility of self-recognition. He says, Dime quien eres, en cambio yo no puedo, sigo cambiando. Tell me who you are. Instead, I cannot. I keep changing. Throughout his work, Manuel Duran faces the past and does so with horror and also with fascination. A reaction as intense and complex as Duran cannot be attributed <coughs> to the desire to return to the lost paradise of childhood, as there must be something else that justifies this feeling of loss, the search for a center, the excessive restlessness produced by his uncontrollable memory, and that reason can only be exile which can work as the ingredient of his writing. Not the only one, of course, but the responsible for the intensity of his desolation, his intimate restlessness, and the configuration of some very special symbols at the center, like the metaphor of the settlement and the roots that he lacks, and the island that suggests the loneliness of the exile. In any case, we can read, we can read Duran's poetry as a manifestation of his existential attitudes common to all human beings. The hours of time, the lack of meaning of life, the uncertainty and loneliness caused by all of this, as they constitute what is been called the eternal themes of the poetry of exile. It is possible that the Duran poets ask the readers to look deeper if we want to meet the Duran persona, 
Because although this poetry deals with eternal themes, if we want to find its true meaning, we must observe, we must observe them from the perspective of exile, which is also what um, Roberto Ruiz is telling us. Roberto Ruiz also was born in Madrid in 1925. As Duran, he fled with his family in 1939, and he lived in France, the Dominican Republic, Mexico, and later the United States. He's also been an active scholar, working at uh, Wheaton College in Massachusetts, where he retired as a emeritus professor in 1995. He's published less, only five books, a collection of short stories, and numerous articles and essays, but he has a substantial unpublished books. More than 10,000 10, unpublished pages that will be donated to Harvard Library upon his death. Maybe it was his low profile, or the fact that we've been exchanging mail, written mail, over the years. But ever <coughs> since I started this research journey, I always thought that his work deserved more attention than the depth study from the critics. And he has remained as one of the most unknown writers of his group, both in Mexico and Spain, and of course in the United States. Ruiz admits that his historic circumstance has defined his work, that the bitter experience of the exile is the generating force of his work. And he said, <coughs> those who had experienced the war like me and the refugee camps of France and the four exiles we had to face, they have to face once again the ghost of infinite immigration, the everlasting foreign feeling, and had to wonder if this wouldn't be the normal condition of our species. Roberto Ruiz distanced himself from his writing partners from the second generation because his work is not understood as a nostalgic name or a symbol of the traumatic experience of the exile, but rather is characterized by a strong realism and an obvious moral concern portrayed in characters and symbols of marginalized, excluded, and misunderstood <clears throat> men by society. Ruiz's work offers a particular vision of the world, and even without making a specific spatial or temporal references like Duran, he achieves universality as his concerns acquire a symbolic function extrapolated to different experiences and contexts. We can connect with the writing style to tease out the idea of the objective plurality, described as a, as a way of transmitting to the reader a particular idea or emotion through external factors that cross a specific sensory experience. With comments on the matter, in quote, that some of, my, some of my work reflect war and exile, and others don't. I've tried to leave exile behind as a subject and turn it into a perspective to understand reality. <coughs> Instead of telling my story seven times, I would rather create a world seen by mar a, a marginalized exclu or excluded subject. Unquote. The work of Roberto Ruiz, his five stars, is worth reading because in, in his pessimist style, we a fierce criticism and an anti-militarist statement of the injustice and aberrations of the wars. Anyway. <coughs> El Último Asis is one of his books that was published in 1964 that portrays the hard experience of survival in a refugee camp in France. The main characters of this novel are the most vulnerable groups of all, women, children, and the elderly. <coughs> Rui, in this book, managed to make a refugee camp a reconditioned object space of existence, reversing these spaces to enable the camp to create its own discourse and paradoxically to become a source of identity for those prisoners that are held there. In the end, one of the main, main, the main characters of the book is liberated. And he says, he admits that despite the fever, the cold, the pain, the hunger, despite all of that, that third pavilion had been a refuge and an oasis, perhaps the last oasis. And I quote, now that I have to follow my freedom, I have to go back to exile. End of quote. In another book, Paraíso Cerrado Cielo Abierto, Ruiz continues to affirm his total opposition to the war and reflects about the question of the exilic condition. This is an experimental novel with a clean and realistic style that denounces the alienation of contemporary men in the midst of a possible third world war. The story takes place in an island, again a metaphor of the exile, showing that the confinement of men, the lack of opportunities, and the impossibility of escape in this work, men come to an absolute loss of identity, producing a deep confrontation between human beings and the universe. Ruiz offers a decadent and pessimistic vision of modernity, evidenced by a society without values or dream aspirations. The last pages of his novel are enlightening, 
The same thing as we find in an ulti, in an ultimo oasis, one of the officer or warders of the prison tries to escape. Uh, but he must assume that the harsh reality is out, outside those, those doors. Um, it's a hopeless future, and then he says, ya adelantaba con fugarse a dónde iba a la guerra, no sabe que todo está en ruinas y no hay dónde meterse, que solo aquí se vive en paz. Again, he portrays the exile, uh, the imprisonment, as his own space of representation, actually their own freedom. As we've seen from Manuel Durán and Roberto Rui, the acceptance of this exilic condition, uh, circumstance as a condition of their own being, has transformed these children into a generation with unique stories that go beyond the social historical barrier to reach a fully existential meaning of collective memory. Because these children are neither Mexican nor Hispanic. They've been suspended between two worlds, sometimes even three for those who came to the United States, and have their roots in the air, have trans they have transcended their experience to a universal dimension, making the impossible possible, becoming real citizens of the world, patriots of the land they live in, whatever that land may be. These children of the war, by understanding and accepting their exilic conditions, they were finally able to turn their alienation into their own identity. The exile became real the moment they accepted it as their own. Those who were the Spanish children of the war became the Hispano-Mexicanos, a hybrid dual label that allows a multiplicity of identities and promotes a reflection about individual and its belonging to the world. And let me finish with a quote of Manuel Duran, who uses the metaphor of the train to talk to describe the experience of the Spanish exile in 1939, and specifically, el furgón de cola, or the main carriage of the train, or for that of the members of his generation. Those children who were left behind, halfway, almost without memories, but fortunately for us, they are the last living witnesses of this tragedy. Therefore, he reminds us, and he's asking us to do something, and I quote, he says, let us not forget that at the end of the trains in the Furgón de Cola, there used to be a large garden of light. In our case, that light was made of our hopes, our desires, sometimes also our anger and our assentities. But we never gave up. With every little victory of ours was a way of saying no, that we would never give up. And now, when the train has already reached its last station, this light is in your hands, your minds, and your hearts. You. Those who study and appreciate what we have done, please do not let the light go away. And we won't. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gomez Martin, for your presentation. And so now we will continue with Dr. Rachel Linville. Uh, Dr. Linville is an associate professor of, of Spanish at the College of Rockford, SANI, where she teaches course on Spanish literature, film, and culture. Her research focuses on 20th and 21st century Spanish novel and film. Her book, La Memoria de los Maquis, Miradas sobre la Guerra Antifranquista, analyzes the collective, traumatic, and historical memory of the literary and filmic representations of the anti-fascist resistance movement that opposed Francisco Franco's regime. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you to the work of the graduate students who have helped Professor Nardo organize this conference, and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, today, I have chosen to focus on Max Alb and Mazuko. For me, El Mazuko is a place of memory that helps to keep alive our recollections of the Spanish Civil War and the exile it caused. Of the many writers who were forced to flee Spain, I have decided to focus on Max Alb for several reasons. He is an example of an exiled Spanish writer whose works communicate the diversity of the Spanish exile through the topics covered and the situations portrayed, as well as through the numerous genres I'll use and the points of view his works capture. His life story, which is quite frankly fascinating, uh, is also a reminder of the countless ways Spaniards could experience the phenomena of exile. The numerous articles Sotonia Narro has published on Max Alb attest to his fascination with this author and his life. In addition to these articles and the chapters in his books that he has dedicated to Alb, José María Narro also wrote the introduction and critical edition of Campo Francés for Alves' complete works, the epilogue of the Spanish version of Manuscrito Cuervo, 
The critical notes for the French version of this text, and he translated El Cementerio de Jadfa to French. His works on Matel, Juan Ramon Jiménez, Antonio Machado, and several other exiled writers situates him in a long standing tradition at the University of Maryland of professors who have focused their career on the Spanish exile, like Graciela Parado de Remes and the other professors Navarro mentioned earlier, uh, as well as those who have been major representatives of this exile, most notably on Ramon Jiménez himself. Before going into detail about um, Max Al's life and his works, I need to set the stage by referring in general to a few of Professor Navarro's ideals regarding the Spanish exile. He warns against could research. You, could you slow down a little bit? Certainly. <laughs> sorry, sir. Uh, he warns against the, the search and consequent nostalgia for exile or the prolonged fixation regarding the historical limits of the cultural problem of exile. He situates the cultural pentrification of exile in the 1940s, when it becomes the object of attention and publication in Spain. And Franco's regime begins to turn a blind eye to this penetration of these texts. Exile writers began to perceive and debate the need to publish in Spain through channels that did not support the regime. But they also questioned if this would bring them closer, or ironically, separate them further. Some, like Paulino Masi, dreamed of a return, filled with brotherly love, in solidarity, um, and that the moral victory of immigration would instill a nostalgia of freedom in Spaniards living in the interior. For other writers, however, the present became a loss, a dream of a glorious return home that will never occur. Jose Maria Nagro proposes that we should not attempt to understand the Spanish exile in its totality, but consider how we should treat it within contemporary cultural relations. In an attempt to capture the diversity of experiences displaced Spaniards face, he refers to the exile of las Españas, in plural. He also points terms such as infra-exile to discuss these experiences. As he points out, Cuando el infra-exiliado infra intenta volver, se rompe la entropía y aquel se encuentra incapacitado para hacerlo al presente del interior, como el Maxao de la gallina ciega. El uno del memorialista se encuentra con el dolor de saberse otro, de no poder separarse de la piel de ese otro, que le reprocha y le señala sus irremediables diferencias adquiridas en la migración. Me ha dolido tanto que ni un solo día me he sentido suficientemente alejado de las piedras, del cielo, o de las personas para buscarlos con buen humor. Es la fase que llamaría del exilio en el exilio o de infraexilio, ahí donde el, la espiral del ostracismo condena a los exiliados a la derrota del olvido. Although there were shared experiences, such as the dehumanizing process of crossing the French border or the internment camps, each Spaniard brought their own unique circumstances that shaped how they would experience them. It is hard to imagine anyone else with as unique a background as Max Al, one that repeatedly would make him a suspicious other. Al refers to his double, triple, maybe even quadruple otherness in his diarios. ¿Qué daño no me ha hecho en nuestro mundo cerrado? El no ser de ninguna parte, el llamarme como me llamo, con nombre y apellido que lo mismo puede ser de un país que de otro. En estas horas de nacionalismo cerrado, el haber nacido en París, y ser español, tener padre español nacido en Alemania, madre parisina, pero de origen también alemana, pero de apellido a esclavo. Y hablar con, este, con ese acento francés que desgarra mi castellano, qué daño no me ha hecho. El agnosticismo de mis padres, libre pensadores, en un país católico como España, o su prosapia judía en un país antisemita como Francia. Qué disgustos, qué humillaciones que no me ha acarreado. In 1914, when Al was 11, his family fled from France to Valencia due to his father's nationality and last mother possessions. So how is it that he would be arrested in France in 1940 due to a text written by the text written by the Francoist embassy to the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs that denounced him, denounced him as a communist of dangerous activities and as a Jew who had been nationalized by the Red government? Between 1914 and 1940, there would be several more border crossings and a series of events that would influence Alb's life. One additional 
question is, was Abu a communist? Abu became a member of the Socialist Party, Partido Socialista Obrero Español, in 1929. Although he joined the Alianza de Escritores Antifascistas para la, para la Defensa de la Cultura, and in Paris, he participated in the preparations of the Second Congress of Anti-Fascist Intellectuals, both of which were dominated by communist intellectuals, he was never a member of the Partido Comunista de España. After working in France on the project just mentioned, Max Howe returned to Spain in 1938 to film Sierra de Teruel with, Mac, uh, with André Malcro. In Conversación Postmortem, uh, Al comments on his surprise at Monroe's decision to work with him. Just double checking. Oh, sorry, if I didn't read you, you have the Spanish on one side, English on the other. Uh, nadie supo quién era hasta que Marlowe se decidió a mi gran sorpresa llevarme con él para hacer Sierra de Teruel. Empezaron a tenerme por comunista, menos los comunistas, por supuesto. Even though Al dedicated at times, indicated his, at times his desire to see communist ideals succeed, his criticism of totalitarianism in Stalin's USSR, the pact of non-aggression between the Nazis and the Soviets, as well as certain aspects of communist ideology, would ultimately be treated with intolerance by communists. He later maintained a close friendship with PCE, Partido Comunista, uh, members, uh, with ties to Juan Negrín's Sere, Servicio de Evacuación de los Refugiados Españoles, but these relationships did not help him emigrate from France to Latin America after the Spanish Civil War. Thanks to Professor Nardo's archival research, we know that it was someone linked to these immigration services and not the local government that impeded Al's immigration. In a 1970 prologue to Lorenzo Mágico, Al writes, I Immediately after his arrest in April of 1940 and subsequent internment in the Verde, a concentration camp used by the VC government to house foreigners considered suspect or dangerous, Al sought the help of important politicians and intellectuals, including the former minister Julian Dumartagoitia and the French writer Jules Roman. In his correspondence with Al, Roman highlights the arbitrary and xenophobic nature of the detentions. For the vast majority of those detained in the camp, there was not a shred of evidence against them, and to free themselves they had to prove their innocence a system that recalls the guarantees for our bodies of the Franklin's repression. Al was released from Verde in November of 1940, only to be rearrested in Nice, where he spent 15 days in the city jail in June of 1941, despite having a letter of safe passage. He would again be arrested on August 26, 1941, and turned a second time in Verde in September, and subsequently deported to Jadfa, a punishment camp in Algeria. Even a decade later, and as far, as far away as Mexico, the false accusation that he was a communist continued to influence his life. In his Carta al Presidente Vicente Aureol from 1951 in the collection Aldo como Hombre, Al protest the denial of a visa entry to visit parents in France. He reaffirms his identity as a socialist and rejects the idea of having to become an anti-comunista or come comunista just to be forgiven. For what, he asked, a false accusation? It was not until 1957 that Alp's police file was finally exonerated. Considering Alp's life experiences, it is not surprising that the topic of the arbitrariness of accusations, laws, frontiers, and one's own identity receive attention repeatedly in his works. Let us return a moment to his Carta al Presidente Vicente Aureol. Ya sé que estoy fichado, y que esto es lo que cuenta, lo que vale. Que lo que diga la ficha sea verdad o no, eso no importa, ni entra en juego. Es decir, que yo, mi persona, lo que pienso, lo que siento, no es la verdad. La verdad es lo que está escrito. Yo, Marchao, no existo. El que vive es el peligroso comunista, que un soplón denunció un día, supongo por justificar su sueldo. It amazes me that someone so affected by papers, either the papers Al sought to defend himself and free himself from the concentration camps, or the papers on which the initial false accusation was made, or any other papers, is able to, to this, discuss this topic with such humor. In Manuscrito Cuervo, 
out indicates that the text was written by a crow, J.R. Bululu, who has descended into Verne, analyzes the arbitrary and absurd nature of humans, and ultimately points out that humans are inferior to crows. I will read a few excerpts from one part called Menos Papeles. Los hombres, los hombres uh, tienen en mucho poseer el mayor número de papeles donde se asegure, o infantilísimo o cortedad de intelecto, que ellos son ellos y no su vecino. Suelen decir frases sacramentales que se oyen en todo momento. Sí, yo tengo todos mis papeles. Sí, todos mis papeles están en regla. Lo sorprendente es que no sirven para nada. Lo cierto es que no se atreven a vivir sin ellos y son capaces de dar cualquier cosa por conseguirlos. Algunos he visto encerrados por intentar tenerlos rápidamente, otros por carecer de ellos, consecuencia de la absurda, monstruosa importancia que dan los hombres a lo impreso. Jacobo, the pro, goes on to discuss other types of papers, earth papers, which humans prefer. Llegando por mi afán de conocer, y aún por la curiosidad, comí uno de los tal. Puedo asegurar que no difieren de los demás papeles. En este text, we also find the affirmation that no cuenta la vida, sino lo, que, sino lo escrito. An idea that I would later echo, as we just saw in his letter to the French president. At the end of this piece, Jacobo concludes, Son capaces de matar con tal de conseguir unos papeles, aunque sean falsos. Supongo que esta absurda costumbre contribuye en mucho al triste estado actual del hombre. It is hard to think of a truer statement at a time when immigrants die trying to cross land and water borders in the most dire of situations, because they do not have papers. If they survive that ordeal, many still end up in concentration camps. If we should consider how to treat the topic of exile in the works of exiled writers within contemporary cultural relations, as Jose Maria Navarro proposes, then perhaps we should take heed, particularly now as nationalism is on the rise again, to Max Au's warnings about the arbitrary natures of frontiers. And another section of Manuscrito Cuervo from De, las, de la Muda y de las Fronteras, Jacobo writes, Se dice que frontera es algo muy importante que no existe y que, sin embargo, los hombres defienden la pluma y pico, como si fuese real. Estos seres se pasan la vida matándose los unos a los otros, o reuniéndose alrededor de una mesa, sin lograr entenderse, como es natural, para rectificar estas líneas inexistentes. Before concluding with Max Alvin moving on to a Mazupa, I want to address one more aspect about his work, which seeks to address the arbitrary codes that govern reality. Alb has experimented with many genres, including novels, film scripts, diaries, theater, and poetry. As Professor Narva has pointed out, the use of all of these genres, as well as the multiplicity of versions and points of view in Alb's works, attest to his attempt to respond to the codes in the ways that are systematically arbitrary, not only within the concentration camps, but also in the world outside of the camps. In some stories initially fleshed out during his time in Verde, our style of writing suggests a moment of composition that is spontaneous to a presence in the camps. His texts read like a translation that appears true and testimonial, more like a chronicle, and not a text that was later altered. In Historia de Vidal, he uses the present tense in the reference to a fellow inmate. No sé si te acuerdas de él. He points to a narration which suggests a narration made from within the camps and an internal memory. Neither the voice nor the space evoked by this narration escaped the confines of the camp. In Tierra de Jelpa, Al defends the use of poetry, particularly romance, as a pure form that divests from the presence of the witness. Cuando en el campo entendí escribir lo más sencillamente posible lo que acontecía, el verso uh, salió. El verso es lo más In the film script Campo Francés, he would try to document what he lived and suppress the voice of a narrator by projecting newspaper titles and photographs as well as contemporary films. 
However, Alp's stories dealing with the concentration camps began to change with respect to the narrative voice and the spatial and temporal distance suggested by their discourse. These changes differentiate these stories from earlier works in which Alp sought to achieve a testimonial style devoid of any distance. The latter narratives use the past tense and points of view that suggest an external memory that is after the time of the camps. Despite the variation of genres and the varying distance evoked by the narrative voices, many of these texts, as well as Alves' works that do not strictly address the theme of the camps, like his letter to the French president, have one element in common. They point to the arbitrary nature of daily life, both inside as well as outside of the camps. Alves adopts discursive strategies that reveal that our day-to-day -day living, that he thought was controlled by codes, that were universal, objective, and trustable, is governed by rules that are as arbitrary as the ones that govern life in the camps. In both Enero Sin Nombre and Campo Frantes, Al portrays the arbitrary nature of the detentions. Several of the prisoners in Enero Sin Nombre started a conversation by asking each other why they are there, which points to the accidental or arbitrary nature of their detention. The responses often address the character's ignorance of any possible reason or hope to be released as soon as the evident judicial error is uh, righted, using the systematic uniformness of the law to correct the arbitrariness of the detentions. These examples clearly relate back to Alp's personal life. His an initial arrest due to the false accusation, as well as a subsequent arrest, by, sorry, a narration of Samuel Navarro discovered in the archive uh, the Archivo Fundación Max Al Segorbe is very revealing with respect to Al's perspective on the arbitrary nature of his detentions. It depicts a gendarme, or French police officer, doing the habitual interrogation. Visita del gendarme. Vengo a hacer un informe. ¿Es por el salvo conducto? Sí. ¿Ha visto usted mi expediente? Sí. Entonces, por eso, Mi padre se llama Federico. Mi madre, ¿por qué llenar en un tenedor de papeles? ¿Qué quiere usted? Es la costumbre. Aquí basta que haga 50 años que se le condenara a una multa para que no se borre. Aunque haya habido 100 minutos, a usted lo denunciaron por hombre peligroso. Aunque luego se demostró que no, pues ahí sigue la denuncia. It didn't seem to matter how many times. Al attempted to clear his name, to seek freedom from the camps. The 1940 accusation would continue to follow him until he was exonerated in 1957. I also want to talk today about El Mazuco. For me, El Mazuco represents the flip side of exile, the return. Not a flip side as in an opposite, but perhaps as in the refrain, La otra cara de la moneda, suggests two parts of a whole. The visit, the visit to El Mazuco is one activity during the conference Professor Navarro organizes every August in Yanis and Asturias. The title and topic varies year to year, but in general it addresses the complex historical and present day phenomena of borderlands, diasporas, displacements, and exiles. Presenters have included historians, literary and film critics, musicians, as well as Spanish guerrilla fighters living in Spain and France and Spaniards exiled to the USSR as children. Thus, for some of the pre presenters and participants, the conference offers them a reason to return, to return and to remember. Because the conference is an academic initiative on diaspora studies, students can earn university credit for participating. For the younger generation, this punto de encuentro becomes a way of learning, of acquiring a historical memory of the Spanish Civil War and the Spanish exile. When I participated in 2006 and 2009, we visited El Mazuco, which was the site of a battle in eastern Asturias in September of 1937. After a steep climb, we came to an impressive view. As you can see, it is a mountainous area. You cannot really see the trenches in this photo due to the ferns, but they are still there. The Pass of El Mazuco was an area forces loyal to the Second Spanish Republic defended to prevent the fall of Asturias, which had become isolated from Republican-held areas in the south and east of Spain. They were shot at and bombarded from just about every direction. From the sea, as you see in the distance in this photo, five kilometers to the north, El Almirante Cervera's six-inch guns bombarded them. 
The German Calendar Legion bombed them from the air, the first time a military target was carpet bombed. On the road leading up to the pass, there stood, until recently, a monument seen defaced here, commemorating the German participation in this battle. On September 6th, the first day of the battle, the Republican forces, many of whom were young Indianos, stopped the advance from the south, despite being outnumbered seven to one. Felipe Matarra, who fought in the battle and later joined the guerrilla, guerrilla resistance, described how they defended themselves with not much other than shotguns and rifles. They filled jars with dynamite screws and other scrap metal and threw them towards the advancing rebel army. These rudimentary bombs made impressive explosions, uh, but their reach was far too short to do real damage. Nevertheless, it helped, resist, uh, helped to resist the first 24 hours, and on September 17, 7th, the Republican commander, Eugenio Carmacera, arrived with three battalions of 24 heavy machine guns, and the fronts stabilized. The Republican forces with no aerial support and little artillery compared to General Sorchaga's 15 artillery uh, batteries were eventually defeated, leading to the subsequent fall of Gijón on October 21st, the last Republican stronghold in northern Spain. Through the help of Jose Maria Narro in this conference, I met several guerrilla fighters that I interviewed as I wrote my dissertation on the literary and cinematic representations of the Spanish guerrilla resistance to Franco's dictatorship. One was Felipe Matarraz, and the other, Jose Antonio Alonso Alcalde, Comandante Robert, who also returned several times to Spain to participate in the conference held in Yanis. To interview Robert, as he is effectively called, I went through Castres, France, where he lived with his French wife and his children until his death in 2015. After fighting in the Spanish Civil War and crossing the French border, Robert was interned in the concentration camp at St. Holmes. Later, he led the liberation of Foix, a significant victory in the resistance against the Nazis. Finally, during the invasion of the Aran Valley, he was in command of 200 guerrillas that returned to Spain to oppose Franco. This invasion, in which about six to 7,000 guerrillas participated, um, it eventually failed um, in its attempt to create a stronghold in Spain, um, but it was seeking to attract the attention of democracies. It only lasted about 10 days. Um, nevertheless, it did succeed in, in adding many fighters to the ranks of guerrilla organizations that already existed in Spain. One major appreciation I gained from talking to Robert was the incredible difference between how guerrilla resistors were treated in France and Spain. Spaniards who fought in the French resistance to the Nazis and their French comrades are remembered, revered, and honored frequently in ceremonies in France as liberators. In Spain, there are organizations like La Garilla Verde that organize conferences uh, and ceremonies to honor the guerrilla resistance, like the one seen here in Santa Cruz de Moya, but they are extremely small scale and do not receive attention in regional news coverage and much less national uh, media. The last image shows the monument to the guerrillas. Although the exhibition of motives for what would become the law of historical memory of 2007 referred to the Franco's guerrillas as combatants, their, rehabil their rehabilitation fell into oblivion. None of the articles of this law addressed the need to expunge the Franco's police files that referred to them as malhechores and manoleros, evil doers and bandits. The anti-Franco's guerrillas have, in large part, been forgotten, and the official memory that exists is clearly one that defames them. Laws and police files, however, are not the only artifacts that point to the memory of the guerrillas. Literature and film also portray how different groups remember them and how the diverse collective memory have evolved from 1936 to today. They also tell the story of exile and the difficulties writers and directors face. Many of these works um, would face delay delays. After the fall of Barcelona, Maxel crossed into France with the Sierra de Teruel film crew and his diplomatic passport. He did not go immediately to the concentration camps like many Spaniards but was able to finish the film with Juan Roth. Nevertheless, Sierra de Teruel was not distributed until 1945, after the end of World War II. Alvin and many of the other exiled Spaniards would find in Mexico an adoptive home. 
From there, Luisa Carnes published Juan Caballero in 1956, and Ramon J. Sender, Mosen Millan, in 1930, uh, 1953. His novel is better known by the title It Would Bear. It is not surprising that in general these works offer a favorable representation of the guerrillas and their precursors, the huidos, those who fled to avoid Francoist reprisals. In the case of Sierra de Teruel, the film responds to the Republican government's desire to attract international support at a moment when the outcome of the Spanish Civil War was still undecided. Alves' script, which adapts on Rowe's novel, The Squad, tells the story of a group of Republican aviators and resistance fighters who collaborated to blow up a bridge in Tenerife and portrays the procession of townspeople who rescue the injured Republican aviators. We should not forget that this would not be the first time that Al promoted a Republican cause. As subcommissioner for the Universal Exposition Pavilion in Paris, Al asked Picasso to paint, uh, to create a painting, which would later become known as Canica. At about the same time that these works appeared in France and Mexico, two other novels were published by the American Ernest Hemingway and the Hungarian Brit Emmer Pressburger. Their respective novels for Hunger Bell Tolls and Killing a Mouse on Sunday depict the guerrilla resistance during and after the Spanish Civil War less favorably, but do portray the political motivations of the resistors, which distances these texts from all other forms of Franco's memory laws, decrees, police files as well as works of fiction, that attempted to discredit the guerrilla resistance by depoliticizing it. <clears throat> Hemingway's fascination with Spain is clear starting with his 1926 The Sun Also Rises. After his initial intrigue with the running of the bulls, he would return to Spain as a journalist. He wrote at least 30 dispatches on the Spanish Civil War from Republican-held territory between 1937 and 1938. However, after Franco's victory, Hemingway continued to visit Spain. These subsequent border crossings would be politicized by addicts of the regime, like Rafael Calvo Cheret. In his 1962 book, Calvo Cheret suggests that Hemingway held a favorable opinion of the 1936 uprising by stating, La presencia reiterada de Hemingway en España durante estos años de paz puede ser un indicio de cuál fue su actitud. The euphemism with which he refers to the era of the dictatorship responds to the desire to portray Franco as a leader who ensures peace and prosperity, a rhetorical strategy used to justify Franco being in power. In concluding, it is clear that the politicized border crossings, the challenges of exile, the difficulty or impossibility of returning home for some, and the ability of others to return and to keep memory alive through conferences are all experiences related to Líneas inexistentes, as Max Alp called frontiers in Manuscrito. <coughs> Imaginary lines that caused real wars, real exile, and real pain. Thank you. But then in about the last paper about Max uh, House being persecuted in, in, in France. And I think uh, the Marcelo was Jose Felix de Lequerica, who actually is interesting because he's a man who, when the Vichy government, you know, takes power in, in a, on the German survive, he negotiates the peace so France doesn't have a war with, with the Germans. And also in your notes over here, you mentioned about looking for his ancestors, so they knew that he was a, yes, you mentioned already before, a Polino, a communal side. So it really gets into, into him, because he's French and also you, and the Vichy government. And this later on, this ambassador comes to the US, and this is what we negotiate, you know, Franco, La Ronda, and so on and so forth. It's really um, fascinating how, um, even though he has those, visas given by the Mexican government, 
where basically many of the Spanish came, went to the Vichy government in Mexico. But he was never respected. I mean, uh, most of the Mexican, it was the second generation probably bigger than the one in 1939, the France connection from uh, Spain and Cecilia. So that's my moment. Thank you, a very interesting comment. Yeah, I think with this history of uh, so obviously the, the relation between Spain and France, but also with Germany, um, that that was a when they was eventually taken over, and um, and then how Jews that were later, so we see multiple elements that can be played in, in the history of my town. From the, from the blushing moments right, in which uh, dear disciples uh, and now friends um, uh, bring forth a small amount of the contribution that I could have made to, to the study of, um, of exile and its, uh, its legacy. and I think this, is, this has been clear from all five presentations, um, that this legacy is certainly alive. It is alive from the point of view of what we can study and how we can bridge um, past territories with present ones. And I am afraid future ones. And it is alive because you have taken on this legacy and you have all taken it with care, with passion, with deep and sound analysis. You have chosen to bring forth those voices that were forgotten. The career. Roberto Luis. Maria Teresa. Leon. Concha Mendes. Ernestina de Chapulcí. Or you have made analogies with St. Clair and Ramon Jiménez and the Spanish Civil War. And the only thing that I can say in the name of all exiles, in the memory of those that fought, that left their youth. I remember Robert saying, well, I was 18, I was 20. And when you're 18 and 20, the only thing you wish is to go dancing with some girls. And we were not able to do that. And they were still strong enough and ethical enough to respect and to defend the freedoms they had been taken away by the dictatorship and that they were hoping to regain and bring back, still in their own youth. And they were not able to do so, as we know. And it was such a long night. And that long night also made possible for such a rich legacy. That is the paradox of exile, as we all know. It's, it's that pain that eventually produces these outstanding works. And therefore, I think that this is, in fact, what our old Juan Ramón Jiménez always fought and 
attempted to preserve in his work. He knew that by naming, his legacy would be named. And to me, to us, to that memory, we are not sure that at least from the vantage point of this institution that we have been all so fortunate to be accepted together that that legacy is going to be preserved and that naming is going to be renamed. And I cannot thank you in the name of all of those that preceded us, all of those that are here with us, and all of those that you will also pass on the torch. Thank you. Gracias. Maria, you spoke about uh, Duran in his um, in his exile, and you reference his works, and you say that you know you indicate to us that there was in his works, is, is, as far as I'm understanding from what you're saying, is that there's no reference to exile, and I'm I'm wondering what was his purpose for not, was it, a, was it a personal conviction that by bringing forth exile or the, or the condition of the state of exile's works, that would somehow take him back to a place that he didn't want to be? Was it a, a political strategy? I'm just wondering why it was that because so many of the writers that we study during the Civil War and post-Civil War, exile is something that is, it pervades their texts. It's something that you can't escape, whether it's implicit or explicit. So I'm wondering if, if there's no, you know, no reference to exile. Why was that? As far as you understand from his work. There's no evidence to Italian or even aside from Spain. Like Italian or Spain does not exist in his work. But I think, as he said, and the same thing happened with Roberto Ruiz, and that's the kind of like the importance of this generation is that exile, that maybe for the first generation could be a, a theme or a like motif in the work. In this case, it's way more than that. It becomes, they say, a perspective to understand in their own lives. So it's everything. It doesn't have to be there because it's everywhere. It's them. So in general, like they, I mean, the things they, they have behind, they're always talking about war, about marginalized people, about imprisonment, about escaping. So there's no need. There's always this question about themselves, their identity, but there's no need to mention Spain or Mexico for that reason, or, or any other country. Because as they said, their country, as Jose de la Colina said, so they advise that exilio. Um, what else do we need to know? To me, that's, that's amazing. And I suppose I'm not familiar enough with Duran's works, but I wonder if at any point it somehow becomes the elephant in the room. And I know what you're saying, and I can understand that in some of the, the works on exile that, that I've read and in the author's words, is a part of their identity. It's something that somehow does seep into the text simply because of their own being. But at some point when you read Duran, is there this Thing that it pops rest, up. It resonates. This is, it resonates, but there's this elephant in the room that he's not addressing. Is no, but actually, on the last um, with Duran, I exchanged email with Roberto Ruiz letters, 
in one of our last emails, he said, he said to me that he's writing his memoirs right now. When he's 90, 94 years old. And that's his unfinished work. And he's never had maybe the energy to, 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 to deal with something that big. Uh, but he said that he had all the intention to publish it. So hopefully he will do that soon. If not, it was more than but for sure. It would be interesting to read what he has to say about his own life. Some of these, uh, the children of the second generation, they, they, they write poetry, they write novels, they sort of stories. Some of them, they also return to their memories and they have some sort of autobiographies. So they make share words because all of them need to express themselves in a different way. That's why it's difficult to categorize them as a whole, as a group. And instead, I always prefer to see them separate like individuals. Thank you. Thank you to Rachel and Maria for <clears throat> very fascinating papers. Um, and I just wanted to follow up on, on your question. And I think that for, for Duran, especially for Duran, who became this you know professor and and, and, uh, and also uh, married a woman who came from a very well off family. Um, and the, I, when I read his poetry, and then the, you know when he doesn't mention or he doesn't want to talk about it, I think that there is also a sign of respect for those who were not uh, were not that lucky, and for those who were not that privileged. Um, it's very interesting because um, Duran <clears throat> finished his PhD dissertation with Jorens at Princeton and um, Roberto Ruiz started his PhD uh, dissertation at Princeton with Jorens but uh, there was a turning point in his life when he married his wife and he uh, decided that he wanted to be a fiction writer and uh, he didn't want to be writing a dissertation about Benito Perez Gardos for seven years. So that marked his life towards the opposite, so to say, because he never had you know, the privilege of having a PhD, applied for jobs in more prestigious institutions, and, uh, and then his life went in a totally different way. Then the other thing was also, um, it's a double exile from the point of view uh, many times, especially for, for Roberto, uh, because they were exiles when they were children, and then they came to the U.S. and it was a totally different environment, and they had to, you know, figure it out again when they were, you know, adults. So I just wanted to, to say that uh, in my point of view, uh, from reading uh, Duran, uh, Duran, I think that Duran uh, really talks about that when he actually. Uh, Writes essays about essays about other exiles, and then he feels like he can give a better uh, view of other uh, exiles' works than because he shared some of those experiences.